The Ziggurat of Gudea, ruler of Lagash, circa 2100 BC. There is a text from this period that may refer to the building of a ziggurat. Although archaeologists have not been able to find any traces of a ziggurat from the third millennium. In this passage, Gudea of Lagash describes how he laid out the foundations for constructing a temple dedicated to Ningirsu. While constructing the ziggurat, Gudea explains how he measures and names the seven tiers. Building the house was Gudea's responsibility. He placed the carrying basket for the house on his head with reverence. On the ground, he laid the foundation and built the walls. By stringing the bricks together, he marked out a square. On the site of the temple, he marked out a second square with the following words. Topeoff jars of one ban capacity are marked with this line. The third square was drawn based on the size of the temple as follows. It's an Ansu bird, enclosing its fledgling in its wings. On the site of the temple, he marked out a fourth square, saying, A fierce lion is being embraced by a panther. On the site of the temple, he marked out a fifth square, saying, This is the splendor of the blue sky. A sixth square was marked out on the site of the temple by him, saying, This is the day of supply, full of luxuries. As he marked out the seventh square, he said, At dawn, the moonlight bathes the country with the glow of the E Ninu. Different factors probably influence the development of the ziggurat. Pantheon concept. To create a worldview of their own, the new urban leaders cherry-picked ideas from the ancient religious life of the people. Some aspects of traditional thinking survived in the new approach to religion. Therefore, the reed tabernacle or giguna was preserved and built on top of the highest layer of the ziggurat. It was decorated with precious stones and gold and adorned with cedar wood branches with cedar oil. Perhaps the city god and his divine spouse were married here in the earthly residence of God. Despite being removed from the secular world and inaccessible to ordinary people, it was still the old reed house of God. Herodotus would relate that in Babylon, even in the 5th century BC, the temple on the summit of the topmost tower exhibited a fine oversized couch, richly upholstered. The same reed hut still had the divine presence despite the shrine being empty, and without an image of the god, Herodotus claimed. A new religious constellation included the old meaning of the tabernacle, not abandoning it. King's involvement in finding suitable dwellings for the gods was very much in their interests. As temples modeled after royal households became more popular, the gods began to borrow even more of kingship's characteristics. Although he had little in common with a priest in the Christian tradition, the king installed ahead of the temple the Sangha, which we translate as priest for lack of a better word. It was more the job of the Sangha to maintain the temple and engage the workforce to take care of God's domain. In return, a piece of temple land was assigned to him for his own use. A king could reverse an appointment made by his father to a son in one of these professions. During the third millennium, Sumerian society developed into what was referred to as a temple economy. The temples served as an economic engine for urban civilization. In addition to many landed properties, herds of cattle and sheep, and a large workforce, the temple institutions had access to a great deal of wealth. As the cattle were offered to the gods, they had to be of faultless quality and fattened carefully for the temple rites. The temple estate's produce also fed and paid the temple's workforce. It appears that Uruk was an explosive, rapidly expanding community, and that the new wielders of power were attempting to create a new kingship and political order based on scattered remnants of previous organizations that were no longer capable of meeting the demands of a rapidly changing society. 
as a glue, the new religion bonded the social fabric of urban agglomerations. People had always lived near their relatives, but this bond no longer guaranteed loyalty, cooperation and solidarity when faced with outsiders. The new Sumerian cities were inhabited by both Sumerians and Semites. Forging them into a united body required new mechanisms, so the new ruler began enforcing loyalty and forcing all citizens to bow to him. The ruler acted in the name of the city god and demanded respect from all citizens. An angry city god was a severe peril to the town's existence, a life-threatening threat. City lamentations predict the end of a city when its god departs from its temple, leaving its bewildered inhabitants to face their fate on their own. As a result of the king's economic and military power in the cities, he had to constantly shore up his position to maintain his supporters' loyalty. For this reason, he commissioned particular myths and hymns to celebrate his kingship, and played the leading role in numerous religious ceremonies. On the elevated platforms, or behind tall, impenetrable walls of the new temples, the gods were surrounded by secrecy. Gods lived as sovereigns in their temples, like how kings lived in their palaces. The god's statue was likely hidden behind a curtain in an alcove. As a result of the precious materials used to create them, no divine statues have survived. On cylinder seals, the god is sometimes seen sitting on a cube. There was a footstool under the feet of the gods, and they were seated higher than their worshippers. To transform the lifeless matter of the statue into a receptacle for the Divine Presence, a highly secret and elaborate consecration ritual was required. During a long nocturnal ritual, the priest opened the statue's eyes, nose and mouth so that God was endowed with life and could see, smell and breathe. The gala singer used words alluding to childbirth, a reed mat and birthstones to complete the ritual. In Walker and Dick's interpretations, the ritual for awakening the divine statue was called mouthwashing, which may refer to the midwife's action of cleansing and opening a newborn's breathing passages during birth. We will learn more about the gala priest who accompanied this performance. At the temple, a workshop called the Reed Hut crafted and repaired images. As noted, this may be translated as birth hut. As a result of Mumu's gods creating this unique space in Mumu's house, the god was born in a workshop. The ritual actions were designed to eliminate any trace of human involvement in crafting the statue of God. To be true to the title of the divine effigy, a statue must create this illusion successfully. Temple priests had to take care of a divine statue every day, an explicit and detailed text from the first millennium describes the images in the Temple of Uruk as being served two meals a day, and Oppenheim describes the temple based on this text. At dawn, when the temple opened, the first and principal meal was served, and at night, shortly before the sanctuary closed, the other meal was served. Two courses were served at each repast, the main and second. They have been differentiated by quantity rather than content. According to Babylonian custom, the Mesopotamian image was served its meals in a style and manner befitting a king. Before the image was washed, a table and bowl of water were brought in. In a prescribed arrangement, liquid and semi-liquid dishes were placed on the table, and beverages were placed in appropriate containers. In one of the texts, specific cuts of meat were served as a main dish, and fruit was brought in for a beautiful arrangement. Musicians performed, and God's cellar was fumigated. Oppenheim says fumigation is not a religious act, but a way of dispelling food odors. After the table was cleared and removed, a bowl of water was offered to the image to cleanse its fingers. The dishes from God's meal were sent to the king for consumption after being presented to Gossage. 
It was believed that contact with the divine blessed the food offered to the deity, and the blessing could be transferred to the eater by eating it. All contact between the world of physical reality and the world of God was carefully hidden from human view by linen curtains around the table on which the food was placed and the image itself. It is reasonable to assume that the priests of Inanna surrounded the image with the same care and devotion that they would surround a living king. Using documents excavated in Lagash, one can reconstruct the ins and outs of temple life at the Bao Temple in Lagash. Goddess Bao was the spouse of god Ningirsu, and she was almost exclusively worshipped in Lagash. There were more than 20 temples dedicated to different gods in this Sumerian city-state northeast of Uruk. In some temples, the other gods were accommodated beside the primary god. It has been noted that ur circa 2500 BC, boasted several times that the temple of Ningirsu was rebuilt by him after his dynasty took control of the city. A stone plaque shows him carrying a reed basket on his head, carrying away sand from the richly purified ground before laying a temple's foundation. In the temple archives, archaeologists have found thousands of written tablets. Temple in the narrow street was the name of the Bao sanctuary, while temple in the broad street was named the Enki sanctuary. From Joseph Bauer's study of Lagos and its Bao temple, we know that the temple owned vast lands and was almost self-sufficient. Temple servants had access to a small plot of land they could exploit for a living, and temple property could also be leased out. Bali or Se was the main crop, since it could tolerate the salinity of the soil better than zipping, emmer corn or gig wheat. Aside from pulses, garlic, coriander and cumin, the Bao temple had five orchards in which its servants cultivated dates, grapes, apples and figs. Shepherds tended herds of sheep and goats at the temple, guiding them to lush grasslands. Women servants worked in an area where swineherds and fattened swine were employed. Several canals and lakes were available to freshwater fishermen on temple land leases. Sea fishermen were employed by the temple, who fished 30 to 40 kilometers from the temple with nets. There were two brewers at the temple, a kitchen and a bakery. The gods and barbers also employed apprentice smiths, scribes, cooks, tanners and cupbearers. In exchange for their services, temple servants received barley allotments monthly, with singers and musicians receiving the lowest wages. A funny man also earned his living from a specific parcel of land known as the Ud Tus. There was a distinct category of women workers. Women working in woodworking, flax, textiles, and as assistants to swine and goat herds have their payments registered on the tablets. Women processed raw wool or flax into threads for weaving on looms. Temple allotments were given to adolescent children to make clothing. Workers, even enslaved people working under the temple's supervision, received disbursements and allowances. Her temple served her bread and fish cakes with beer and wine twice daily. It was attached to the Bao temple, and the director position was held by the wife of Lagash's city ruler, who was not called En, but Ensi in this city-state. Pranam Tara, Lugalbanda's wife, held this position while he was king. It has been discovered that Bao's name appears on so many tablets that we can safely conclude she must have been very involved in the daily life of the women's house. Baranamtara's properties usually involve activities that involve the management of Baranamtara's properties, not religious ones. As kings sought to strengthen their hold on the temple organization, they occasionally reformed temple life. His predecessors in Lagash had been too greedy, exploiting the rights of the gods to exploit their property, according to Urukagina, who ruled around 2350 BC. To prevent such corruption, he announced specific reforms. 
Bensi's property was to be returned to the divine owner. The temple oxen of the god were not to be used to plow the Ensi's gardens, and the cucumbers of the Ensi were not to be grown in the best fields of the gods. As Urukagina explains in his reform act, the predecessors had exploited the god's property to enrich themselves. The temple's power was connected to the monarchs, which Urukagina attempted to break. All abusers have been dismissed. The skipper was removed from the boats, the livestock official from the control of the cattle, the fisheries inspector, the silo supervisor, and the temple bureaucrats were dismissed. Ningisu, Bao, and their son, Ulagana, regained vast land ownership. House of Women was reinstalled under the goddess Bao. Under the supervision of his wife, Sarah, he renamed the Household of Women the Household of Goddess Bao. Although he has made numerous attempts, more needs to be accomplished. The division between economic and religious activities was never effectively achieved by his wife Sasa, precisely as her predecessor Baranamtara did. As one of the oldest examples of propaganda, Uruka Gina solemnly promises not to subjugate orphans and widows to powerful interests. Later, such promulgations were often used when monarchs needed to appear compassionate and righteous. Uruka Gina died during his third year of reign, the year in which Baranamtara died. Interment and a memorial festival were part of the state funeral, as we can deduct from the account of the expenses. Ningirsu's temple sent about three quarters of the 148 women, while Bao sent the other quarter. No fewer than 92 gala singers were participating, which translates as wives of elders and ten brothers of Baranantara. According to the second ritual payment account, all these people are listed. They are described as people who shed tears during the funeral rites of Baranamtara. However, they are only a part of the vast numbers involved in the funeral, the payments for the other participants presumably having been listed elsewhere. Each participant received an allowance of bread and beer according to their station, which differed in quality and proportion. This gives us an idea of the workings of the temple on a superficial level. There was little consideration for the religious function of the temple in the economic activities of the temple. It is believed that Baranam Tara was a nin singer, which means lady who is God, since the temple leaders were, first and foremost, servants of the king. It is possible that she was Ningirsu's terrestrial stand-in or second wife, and was on very confidential terms with the temple goddess. Despite this, it is still being determined what exactly the term means. Throughout history, the highest temple offices have become hereditary, and for the most part have remained in the same families. Although mighty families tried to pursue their own policy during the Ur-3 regime, the kings of Ur-3 were strong enough to counter their efforts. During the reign of King Shulgi, 2094 to 2047 BC, administrative texts in Lagash indicate this. The temple of Lagash was controlled by Ur Lama, the then city ruler of Lagash and his family. Their members had become too powerful, bringing them into conflict with Ur's authorities. As a result of the king's actions, the family's property was confiscated and replaced by a top officer at the court of Ur. According to the texts, Ur Lama and his family were driven away, including his four sons. The newly appointed ruler of Lagash then annexed the belongings of some of his predecessors. Sumer's major holy city, Nippur, housed the main temple of Enlil, the highest god of the pantheon of that time, and a temple dedicated to Inanna. Another prominent family dominated Nippur's temple hierarchy, the Arugula, and Uameme and his family administered the temples of Enlil and Inanna. The tablets excavated around these temples provide information about this priest family of Uameme. 
it is not always a rosy picture of this family's history. 300 and 100 BC is the earliest date for the oldest layers of the Inanna Temple. As we will learn, archaeologists have discovered many offerings and figurines like those found in Mari in the Inanna Temples. The small statues were found without inscriptions, but over 40 stone bowls had inscriptions. The name of Inanna was written with the MUS3 sign, and from the inscriptions, we learn that the bowls were offerings to Inanna for the safety of themselves and their husbands. The bowls were imported from Inanna's land, so these offerings were costly. It was passed down to his son, Lugalenga, who succeeded the patriarch Ogula of Inanna's temple in Nippur. Inanna has been depicted in all her glory on a cylinder seal that once belonged to this son. The king had a good relationship with this divinity. The king presents the goddess with the ring and staff of his legitimate kingship, which the goddess holds out over a plant, perhaps a stylized date palm. Inanna's name is engraved on the seal with her MUS3 sign. Ryan Morhen translated the inscription as follows. My dear Amma Sin, Luga Lenga Du, King of the Four Heavenly Corners, Beloved of Inanna, Enlil's Priest and the Perfect Ugula of the Temple of Inanna, Born in Enlil Amaha, a Perfect Ugula of Inanna's Temple and a Priest of Enlil, your servant. Amma Sin, 2046 to 2038 BC, succeeded his father, the mighty King Shulgi, as the third king of the Ur III dynasty. On his, Inanna is referred to as the Beloved of Inanna, just as Enmerkar was referred to as the Beloved Monarch of Inanna in the early myths. According to this inscription, Lugal Engadu was an Ugula of the Temple of Inanna and an Enlil priest. Due to Lugal Engadu's father's dual title and his reference to himself as a servant of King Amar Sin, the temple falls under the direct supervision of King Amar Sin. In the temple archives, Lugal Engadu is mentioned as having four sons. Five sons are mentioned, but not Lugal Gizkim Zi. One text gives us a glimpse of a long running family drama that ended with the death of one of the family members as a reason for this. Four sons of ur me fathers agreed in the text to inherit their father's office as Ugula of Inanna's temple and take over his inheritance. Due to his unfounded charge against his father, the fifth son was sentenced to death in the text. This tablet does not provide any information about the charge. Most likely, he had accused his father of stealing temple property or transgressing other temple taboos. As his father had been executed, he could substantiate the charges against him. His father's high temple office would have passed to him upon his father's death. According to the text, the father appeased the king by bribing him with financial remuneration, so the verdict was never carried out. During the following years, we do not know how things went with the family ur me, me but ten years later, the son again brought a charge against his father. As described in the text, a cultic taboo was violated, and foodstuffs were misappropriated for temple offerings. Nevertheless, Lugal Gizkim Zi was unable to substantiate this second set of charges. Lugal Gizkim Zi was now facing death if the charges were confirmed as grave enough to warrant the death penalty. There was actually a carry-out of the verdict this time. Hammurabi, the famous king of Babylon in the second millennium, established the death penalty as the first law in his codex. It stipulates that a man shall be executed if he makes serious allegations against another man and cannot prove them. Having falsely accused his father, Lugal Gizkim Zi suffered the penalty demanded by law. Natural death is most likely what caused the father's death. 
it was Lugar Gizkim Zi who was the principal heir of his father. Following his execution, his four other sons had to decide how to divide their father's inheritance. 